Yeah? I think that's bullshit. I'm gonna have more money, more money, more, more money, more, what about more weed, okay. more rhymes, more platinum hits. What about over there? More, his coffin. <laughs> more And mighty Iron Mike Tyson comes out blazing against the challenger Bruce Seldon in a devastating first round knockout. Backstage, Iron Mike is greeted by longtime fan Tupac Shakur, who also wrote Tyson's entrance song. I'm in this shit for the honor and the respect. That's why this shit feels so good. I truly believe that I've been blessed by God and that God walks with me. Controversial rap artist Tupac Shakur is fighting for his life. A gunman opens fire on rapper Tupac Shakur's car. He is in critical condition. Rap star Tupac Shakur was riding in this black BMW with a music producer when someone opened fire. It happened on this crowded Las Vegas strip late Saturday night. Five bullet holes hit the passenger door. More shots flattened two of the car's tires. Shakur took several bullets to the chest and is in critical condition in a Las Vegas hospital. When the shooting began, police say Tupac was traveling in a caravan of 10 cars, returning from watching the Tyson Seldon heavyweight match. That shit ain't funny, because if I die before June, I swear to God, I'm a heart, y'all. Tupac wasn't born, he was sent to us. I mean, he got the greatest mother in the world, but he was actually sent to her, and she was good enough to let him come to us. And he gave himself to the world. Given name is Tupac Shakur. I'm from the Bronx. And then I went to high school in Baltimore and then moved to Oakland. He came into the world kind of like in chaos and mass confusion to begin with. You keep in mind, his mother was a former Black Panther. She was, a, she was like part of the Panther 21 trial back in 1971. You know, she wasn't even sure of who, who this man's father was. Our parents, Tupac's and mine, I really felt like raised us to really revere struggle and to look at struggle, the struggle, as a way of uplifting our people and really kind of indoctrinated us to make us feel like that was our role as young people and as men that we had to serve black people. As a matter of fact, an aunt of mine says, she always says to me, um, or she used to always say to me when I was young, that, you know, what are you here for? And if you're not here to serve black people, then you know, what's your purpose? He lived in New York City with the Finney for a time, and, you know, they went from Baltimore and then wound up out in Oakland, so he was constantly moving from place to place. So he never really fit in anywhere. Pop moved out from Baltimore, and what happened was uh, his, uh, he's, uh, I believe, some, somehow related to Linda Pratt. And uh, I guess because of Geronimo, Geronimo Pratt, the great political uh, prisoner, they, they was... Uh, that's his godson or someone like that. But anyways, so the story was that Pac, he stayed, he stayed with us for a little bit, basically, because uh, my sister was, my, his sister was dating my brother. And when he moved out here, he was always into his rap thing. He always wanted to get his rap thing on. And uh, you know what I'm saying? When he came, it was like it was something new for the town, for the neighborhood, because he was so tight that some, we knew that he was going to make it somehow. And uh, you know what I'm saying? He was going to get there somehow, because he, he was always determined to try to get himself about the condition that he was in. Yeah, first time I met Pop was like 86. I met him down at the recreation center and uh that was back in the days we was rapping what we was just coming from the head really. We wasn't doing too much writing and I and he came out and he had like a song written and it was like it was fat. And that's that's how I said that nigga got some shit. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, he had he had tight shit way back then and um then um then I guess then he moved over to this side of town, he was staying right here. And that's when him and my boy hooked up, and him yeah. and my boy was they they hooked and had a thing. They was hella cool. Yeah, you know him and Affinity, uh, his mom is Setua, and him they stayed right here in this apartment right here. 
This is uh, door number one. This is the 89 building. This one of the vines up in the jungle. City here, Marin City, we call it the jungle, right? And um, when I first hooked up with Pop, we was down on the front. It's the storefront out there. It's a parking lot, actually. It's a parking lot area. And uh, we got down there, and he, was, he came up rapping. It was like, it's this new kid in town. Yo, yo, I want y'all to hear, you know what I'm saying, who this dude is, right? So he got down there and started rapping. I came, and say, you know, fronted off with him, see what he had, right? And I did a little rap, he did a little rap. And from there on, we just hooked up, I guess, because what I was doing at that time, which was rapping, and that's what he was, that's what he was about at that time. So um, I introduced him to my cousin Gable, Darren Page, my boy here, uh, Amani, you know what I'm saying? And the whole crew, click, click a lace, and we hooked him up, right? And um, that's when Gabe started, uh, Gabe heard him rapping, Gabe started coming with beats. Yeah. And then him and Gabe clicked. Yeah. And they, uh, then our other, our other, our folks, Demetrius, Demetrius and Gabe, like they was the two DJs in the town. Exactly. So they kind of hooked up with him and collaborated, you know, and they kicked it off. Then they did, they, then they, they was doing their thing. We, then we while. broke it off into the uh, big round table thing, and we call it the crew, uh, the crew little organization. Again. TC. TC, as we know of, straight up out of Marin City. And uh, from there, we, we branched out. We started getting more serious about it, you know, spending more time up in the studio, putting more cuts out of what have you. But my boy Pac was always ambitious, you understand what I'm saying? He was eager, he was hungry, like, he'll, he'll eat rap, drink rap, sleep rap, and it was just like another thing to me, you know what I'm saying? I it, just, was, it was I, added, added into what we did. Exactly. I didn't take it seriously, it was another fad to me, right? But you could tell he was going somewhere with it. Well, like, I remember when he first came out here, actually it was like the second day, and um, he was kicking at the house with my brother, we was eating like we had just had dinner. And what happened was, uh, you know what I'm saying, he, what he, you know what I'm saying? We said, Pac, man, you know how to play hoop? He said, yeah, man, I know how to play hoop and whoop the whoop, you know what I'm saying, like that. We said, yeah, man, let's go see some hoop at the wreck down there, because we, we was all balling at the time. It was like, it was like, you know what I'm saying, everybody wanted to get their ball on, you know what I'm saying, and whoop the whoop. And uh, when we went down to the wreck, we was coming to our surprise. The man did not have played no hoop, man. He was he was a good rapper, but he should have left the basketball alone. He always tried. He would shoot bricks and air rolls and things like that, but it was, it was all cool. Because he, after a while, he said, no, nah, I'm just going to stick to the rap, the rap game, man. He had the New York flat top like he had in Juice. We always laugh at him about it. I went up about 15, 14 at the time. And, um, and my homeboy, uh, Willie Densby, uh, known as Ant Dog, Anthony, he, um, he was going out with Setua, his sister. So Tupac used to always come around to, come around to the house, right? We'd be like, you know, he had the New York with the holes in the pants and, you know what I'm saying, the flat top. You know, we was real bummy and shit. We always talk about him. Oh, look at you, little funny-looking motherfucker. You know what I mean? Like, fuck you. You didn't call me that, you know, that New York shit. And we used to punch him, run around the building. He'd catch one of us. we both beat him up and shit. But he was still like a brother, you know what I'm saying? It's not, they used to tell me about this guy from New York, this new rapper named Tupac. And his name was MC New York. This dude named MC New York, whatever, whatever, whoopty woo, and everybody was telling me how, how good he is, you need to battle him. So whatever, I ended up leaving Florida, coming back to California. And uh, one day I just happened to be at the bus stop, and I was going back to Novato, and uh, here comes Demetrius, friend of Demetrius Stripling, another guy we stand up. We uh, eventually all lived together. Uh, I see him and Tupac at the bus stop, and he's like, hey man, what's up, this is Tupac. And then I'm with my friend Terry August, you know, it's us, my friend and Tupac, and uh, whatever, it was like both of us. So it was like the situation for like a little rap battle, you know, and they was like, oh man, you gotta rap against him, because my partner was a beatbox. And so here we go, he busts out his little rap. He had a song called Girls Be Trying to Work in Nigga or some shit, and he, he, uh, he busts that rap. And uh, it was hella cool, then I bust my little rap, I had little raps too. So we called it a tie. So we was going back and forth, and it was a tie. The bus came, and uh, if the bus didn't come, we weren't going the same place. We probably would have might have just went different ways and might not have just really kicked it. But the bus, we were going the same way. We got on the same bus, so we ended up kicking it all on the bus. And from that, next thing you know, we had a group. And that's when we become One Nation MCs. At first, we didn't have a name. We was like, whatever, we just rapping together. Anyway, so I ended up getting kicked out of my house. And uh, Tupac gets kicked out of the house. He stays in his godmother's house. So we all move in with Demetrius. My other friend, Terry August, got kicked out of his house, so he moves in with Demetrius, too. Demetrius' dad just went to the pen, so he got the house to himself. So <laughs> we all moved in. We're living there. Everything's cool. We got the rap group. Terry's the uh, beatbox. Demetrius is the DJ. Uh, me and Tupac are the rappers. Then my boy, Gable, he was like a good friend of mine. So uh, 
he was like the DJ. He was my DJ, so we decided to have two DJs. Usually when Demetrius is not there, that's when the chaos happens in the house because Demetrius is he's not there to keep the house disciplined, so shit goes chaotic. And uh, Tupac and Terry gets into an argument. The argument was over a Nintendo game who had winners and shit. And Terry was always the one that tried to run the house when Demetrius wasn't there. Tupac and Terry had been arguing all week. Anyhow, Terry told Tupac when he left, man, you better do the dishes because it's your turn to do the dishes and you better have the motherfucking dishes done when I get home. And uh, it was like, I knew he wasn't going to do it, but I guess he wanted to punk him to see what he'd do to see if he'd make Tupac do the dishes. So anyway, it's all day. We're kicking and chilling, playing Nintendo, getting drunk. Here comes Terry and his girlfriend. And not only did Tupac not do the dishes, he spilled like a whole big jug of something on the floor and didn't clean it up. It was fucked up. He should have did that. But he did it just to spite Terry. Here comes Terry walking in. He instantly is going off. He got his girlfriend with him, and he must have been in a bad mood. He's going off on Tupac. Tupac jumps up across the coffee table over to, to, to Terry, jumped all in his face, start cussing him out. They like face to face. You know they about to box me and me, Troy and Gable. We all in there. We just like looking. And Tupac wasn't going for it because Terry was, you know, he was in the wrong, but he was still bullying the shit out of him. And uh, so Tupac. You know, not going for it with his, you know, with his mouth and his attitude. He said, fuck it. He ran up from about 10 feet away, coming with a wild right, and threw it and missed and hit the corner of the washing machine. <laughs> Big washing machine, didn't budge. Well, it was cold. It had to hurt so bad. It said, bam, right on the corner. Whole knuckle was just instantly just swole up. He missed. We start. We're like, oh, he missed. Terry scooped him up, dropped him, and kicked his ass. He didn't go to the hospital after hitting the washing machine, and he was, you know, he was he was a good actor, playing off the pain. We knew he was in pain. His hand swole up twice the size of his hand, and I knew he had to like shatter a knuckle or break a break a finger or something. But uh, he never went to the doctor. It never healed right. And he, yeah, he he was in pain for a long time trying to play it off. That's probably why he, where he got his acting skills. <laughs> we had our little tour thing. We had a little tour we put together. We was going to uh, L.A. to do a show for the New African Panthers. This was hella cool, because to us, this was like, fuck it, we're going to drive to L.A., you know, from like the Bay to the L.A., you know, we're going to do this show for the Panthers in South Central L.A. We hyped. You know, we didn't estimate the traffic and all that bullshit, so we got there like six hours late. And we kept stopping at pay phones, calling them, telling them we'd be there in about an hour. Called them about five times saying that. And uh, we finally got there six hours late. They waited. You know, they wasn't upset with us, wasn't disappointed. We gave them a hell of a show. You know, a hell of a show. We had a couple songs. We had uh, Panther Power. They really liked that. That was like our little, our little anthem song, Panther Power, Panther Power. We had One Nation MCs, and then we had a song called Fantasy. And so we did three songs for them. And they had a whole agenda for us for that night and the following day and all that. And then part of that agenda was a, a self-defense training class, and uh, which included full combat and uh, full contact combat. They taught us some cool stuff, I admit. But it was, you know, it was kind of hard work. But they had to do a lot of stuff. Them brothers know their shit. They can kick some ass. <laughs> they got, they was down with some deep black belts or whatever. Tupac learned a good move. He, uh, he learned a move where if you get knocked down, you're on the ground on your back to, like, crowd your back, put, put all your weight on your back, lean back, and keep one foot cocked back and one foot up and just kick at the person and like just rotate around and just keep your eye on them. And they can't, you know, unless they want to get kicked, they can't really do nothing. You can trip them up also if you know some moves like that. And Tupac learned that. And uh, when the guy, when the instructor called on Tupac to go to fight with somebody, to spar with somebody, the first thing he did before he even threw a blow was drop to the ground and get in that position so he couldn't get hit and he can keep the dude off of him. And it worked, you know. He kicked the dude a couple of times. Dude couldn't get in, so he didn't lose, you know. And uh, came in handy one time in Marin City. Uh, one night, we were all drinking, drinking 40s. My cousin's uh, Jetta. 
and uh, we was having a good time, you know what I'm saying? And uh, we got to talking about girls that we had fucked and what had happened, you know? And I had messed around with one of Tupac's girls and uh, he was like a little bit jealous, <laughs> I guess. And uh, he said, uh, I, we actually started capping, playing a dozen, talking about each other's moms and, you know, his mom was on crack and all that shit. And we were just clowning each other, you know? And it got a little out of hand, got serious. And I told him, uh, basically, from the jungle where we at, we get in your ass, you know what I'm saying? And he said, oh, you ain't gonna whoop me. I said, basically, I bet I can. He said, bet you can't. So uh, I, I induced him to get out of the car. He wouldn't get out of the car. He's talking shit. And I tell him, well, man, this is my cousin's car, man. You gonna get up about my cousin's car. And he wouldn't get out. Tupac, man, JJ, my friend, I don't gotta get out of the car. I'm not, uh, you gotta get out of my cousin's car. JJ, you my cousin, right? You gotta get out of this car, right? Some shit. I don't know what he's telling. He said, uh, and uh, Tupac, I don't gotta get out of nothing. As yeah, so everybody knows, Tupac got a, a big mouth, you know what I'm saying? He'll keep on going and going. So I told him, look, man, looked at my cousin. I said, I'm about to put this dude out your car, you know what I'm saying? Do you got any complaints about that? He said, no. I said, well, Pac, you got to go. And he said, I'm not getting out of shit. So I stole on him. We fighting in the car, you know, he's trying to kick me like a little woman. But uh, we get out the car. Well, I get out the car. I'm trying to get him out the car. I'm reaching in the car, trying to unlock the door. He wouldn't unlock the door. <laughs> Nigga bit me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he bit me. And, uh, you know, I'm going to say he is my dog, though. Now, uh, he bit me. I finally get him out the car. We square off. We kind of... That's what I must have got there, because that's what I came by. He was like this. And he was just... Throwing sets? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, he did bite me, though. We, we locked up. He bit me. I bit him right back. He, he tried to fight. He, you know, he put his dupes up, but... <laughs> But Troy, Troy could box, and Troy was just bam, bam, just kidding him, just, just sticking him. And Tupac ended up falling. Yeah. He, he tried to sweep me, I grabbed his foot, put him on his back, I said, now I'm about to kick you in your face. And uh, he oh, did... Oh, no. Yeah, that, that self-defense move. <laughs> yeah, these niggas are just... Down his back, <laughs> put that leg up. <laughs> yeah, he, they he just... Rotate, he did that move that uh, you didn't go to L.A. I didn't go to L.A. He learned, he learned to move in L.A., he had that leg up circling around so you couldn't come in. I was trying to kick him in his face. Yeah. He got in the form, in the, form the little pose for it and everything. I was like, oh, he's doing the move. And he kicked his leg. And my father just flipped up in the air. Bam! It came down hella hard. It was cold. It was funny as hell. It was the funniest thing I ever saw. Shortly after that, that must have been when he had to fight with my boy Troy. You know what I'm saying? Um, he had fought four stripes, I guess, so to speak, right there. He had earned his position, you know what I'm saying, established himself in Marin City. So then I took him up under my wing, you know what I'm saying, this crew organization that's out here in this jungle, California, right? And um, we got a lot of respect around this community and shit like that. Believe that. There's a few families here that got such amount of respect, you know what I'm saying? So under we took, uh, after we took him up under the wing, it was like it wasn't nobody fucking with him no more, you know what I'm saying? It's like now you're going to have to fight me, Troy, Gable. And, and we meant that. You know, he I meant that. Admit that. So he, he kind of, that was like an initiation for him right there. And he loved he us for that. Troy jumped him in, you know what I'm saying? He loved us for that. Oh, yes, he did. Yes, yeah, he did. we went he to. Remember, remembered us from that day on because of that, you know what I'm saying? We go to Santa Rosa and fight some niggas we don't even know and for our boy. And he'd be the boy. first one to just bomb Caught. on the motherfucker. Hell yeah, hell yeah. You know what I'm saying? After that day, I mean, we, we couldn't even beat him to the punch no more. Hell you know no, he, he knew he that we would. Was... Reverse that shit around. <laughs> he knew that <laughs> we was we was no joke. He said, oh, I'm, I'm with these niggas. You know, these niggas like to throw things. He loved to throw things. You ain't gonna lie. catch him beating the motherfucker. Motherfucker, you know, rarely, you understand what <laughs> Police come, you hear siren, we ready to break back to the car and shit. He want to cut the police out. <laughs> Holy fuck you, mother. Yeah, you he didn't, he hate the police. Hate the police. Hate the police. Let's start he there. Hate the police. He severely hated these people. <sighs> it was one time, um, he was on the front, he was parked down there on the front, I was in my Cadillac, right? I'm sitting there looking out, I'm in the back seat of the car looking at him, um, do this show. It's like he on stage making a motherfucking movie or something on the front. It's like four or five police around him. He's like, you going off. I'm a star. Motherfucker, fuck you. Motherfucker, I'm a star. What you gonna do, punk? Now what? You know what I'm saying? Niggas like, used to try to tell him, calm down, man. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Because a lot of people down there was, you know, doing wrong. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Selling weed, doing everything. Yeah. Bang, 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 yeah, whatever they're doing. We don't want the police over here. No. These <laughs> people. He said, fuck he said, them. Fuck you. Fuck them. And he was just going off. I'm like, man, this man here is sick, man. Was... Okay, well, I'm going to tell you a story about me and Pac, you know what I'm saying, doing a little freaking. Okay, now this was back in the day. This was like 87, 86, you know what I'm saying? We was up at this fool named Jerry Ogbach house, right? Now, at the time, he was grinding heavy, you know, having it his, you know what I'm saying, having it his way. So he asked us to watch his female while he went to go handle some business. So he got me and Pac sitting in the house, you know what I'm saying? We sitting up there rapping, kicking it, you know what I'm saying? His bride on Grimm's heavy. So she running in and out the room, in and out the room. Now, I didn't know she was like nasty like that, you know what I'm saying? But Pac seen it in her eye. He came at me and said, man, I think this is, you know what I'm saying? We might be able to toss her up. 
So what we do, you know what I'm saying? My boy Pac come with the grim shot. He's like, okay, I got a little something, something. We're going to crush him down, roll him up, and offer it to her and see how she act about it, right? So before we even had the opportunity to finish setting up our plan, baby come out the room damn near naked talking about what's up, right? Now, I'm feeling kind of bad because this is Jerry house. We in his house with his bitch, you know what I'm saying? Pac smiling, you know what I'm saying? But now I was feeling kind of bad. So we, we kind of like tried to play it off. You know, it was like, well, you know, we don't know about this freaking you talking about. And baby was like, okay, well, shit, you know what I'm saying? If y'all don't want to fuck with it, you know what I'm saying? And then she leave out the room. My boy Pac come at me. Ice, what you doing? That's bad, man. What's up? You just going to pass it up, you know what I'm saying? So he convinced me, talked me into doing it. So we end up going in the back, you know what I'm saying? Baby end up being like this monster queen, you know what I'm saying? She coming off, slobbing a nigga up, you know what I'm saying? Swinging the booty, everything. You know what I'm saying? Me and Pac do monster freaking. We all get dressed, get back ready. Jerry come in the house, we act like ain't nothing happened. You know what I'm saying? This the kickback spot. He never, never knew, but now you know. <laughs> in actuality, Tupac was, uh, he was quite a serious man, too. It was one event where we was at the Travelize Hotel around the corner. We was all up here parlaying in 79, the next building over from here, right? And uh, we had a few 40s, and we was drinking, smoking on some dozen and shit. And uh, we asked this dude to take us to the hotel, right? So me, uh, Brew, a few of the boys, we got together and parked and went over to the hotel room. So we over there drinking, and the dude get ready to go. He jump up and say, well, I'm getting up out of here. Like he going to leave and, us. Yeah, like he going to just leave us there. And we looked at each other, you know, and looked at him and said, well, partner, check this out. You can't go nowhere until we get ready. So partner tried to raise up out. I bombs on him, you know what I'm saying? My partner Freeze bombs on him, and Pac just came up out of the blue, you know what I'm saying, like a mad Transmanian devil or something, just wailing on the dude. Wham, 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 you know what I'm saying? Kicked him all down the stairs, right? So we leave, we're going back to the room. Pac just pacing the floor, he pumped up, you know what I'm saying, blowing, blowing damn near fire out his nose and shit. Dude is in his car by this time, Pac walk up to the window and just start blazing on it, lock, 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 hitting the window hella hard. I'm like, man, what is you doing, Pac? <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Come on, it's over with. So the police ended up coming and all this type of shit. They put him in the back of the car, put me in one car, you know, find out who we was. But since dude wasn't there, they let us go. We get back to Marin City. This is in Mill, Val in Mill Valley, until I remind you. We get back to Marin City. This boy still got a temper up to here. He take a big ass flower pot for no apparent reason and throw it to the back window of this apartment building over here. I'm like, man. When I, when I knew him, didn't him to live that way. He would have died a long time ago. It's just like a dog. When you have a dog, you can fight the dog all the time. You can keep fighting the dog. But one time, if you fight that dog, you can break that dog's spirit. You know what I'm saying? And that's what I feel would have happened to him if he would have stayed in the jungle. Tupac, you know, he, he was in Marin City. He was going to school there. He was living in the ghetto, you know, selling drugs and everything. But he was also, um, you know, getting involved in these poetry readings, you know, that was run by a woman named Layla Steinberg, who uh, was a part-time teacher at uh, Bayside Elementary School, and um, she also used to do promote shows. She'd promote shows there sometimes um, in Marin City and in other community neighborhoods. And uh, she was working with a rapper named Ray Love. And uh, Ray, uh, um, you know, Ray was trying to pursue his rap career. And then one time she was, I guess, teaching at Bayside Elementary School um, in Marin City, and uh, Tupac uh, came up to her. And um, I guess they had both been reading the same book. And uh, you know, they hooked up, and he became uh, you know, kind of her protege. She was his manager. Uh, him and Ray Love were in the group called uh, Strictly Dope. Ray Love had already been hooked up with Tupac, and they became Strictly Dope. They did a few, they did their thing for a while. I guess they maybe a group. I don't know how long they were a group. They did their thing, and uh, eventually, I guess Tupac wanted to be solo, and hook, Layla hooked him up with Atron Gregory, who at the time was uh, Digital Underground's manager. And Atron Atron was so impressed by Tupac, he went and introduced him to Shock G, uh, Greg Jacobs, uh, Shock G Humpty Hump dude from Digital Underground, the lead, the lead rapper from Humpty, uh, Digital Underground. Gave Tupac like a little live, little audition, just let him bust a rap for him. And uh, he liked it so much, he was just like, well, yo, why don't you come on tour with us? And they took Tupac on tour with him. He became like the Humpty Hump dancer, doing the little Humpty Hump dance. And uh, they went to Japan. They went everywhere. They had a, they went on like a world tour. I was the rodent. 
I was already a shock, and I'm carrying the equipment, holding my faith, you know what I'm saying? That's what I had to do. I'm a hustler. So I um, took that, and on my spare time, when we go on tour, I pick up all the shit I had to pick up, drop it down, you know what I'm saying, and brush down the piano, and Shock would be playing the piano, and like Sir Charlotte for a cane to be rapping at the piano, yeah. and that's when I would let people hear me. I'd always be ready with a rhyme. And I kick around, bony, and everybody started listening to me, and that's how I started getting friends in the industry. Yeah. Then I knew people, you know what I'm saying? That gave me confidence. I would, you know, get more risky, you know, write shit. And then Shock was like, you want to do the same song? And I was like, hell yeah. So I had like 15 minutes to write my part. I just scribbled the shit out, did it. And people really liked it. And he felt good. And he was like, I want you to be the regular underground. You know, I want you to keep me underground, keep me street. Because I would have never thought to do nothing like that. And I want you to keep me down there. And what I'm going to do is give you whatever you need from Digital Underground. He had, he had no place to keep his, keep his clothes and stuff. Because I think Shock moved out of the department right before the tour. Because he wanted to get a new one. So Pac kept all this shit at my place. And he said he was going to help pay rent at my apartment. And, uh, you know, when he came back, he said he would pay for all the time, whatever it was, that he left all this shit there. And uh, when he came back, however, he didn't, he didn't pay me because he said shock fucked him out of some money. And uh, so it was no problem with me. Um, and uh, from that point, he got his own place over in Oakland. Tupac had an apartment in Oakland with all the Digital Underground members. And one incident, I went over there with Mike Cooley, and um, we were smoking blunts, watching Brenda's had a baby. It was the first day it came out, you know what I'm saying? He was on the phone calling New York, calling everywhere. He was hella hyped about it and shit. And he just kept smoking, kept choking. And uh, somebody knocked on the door. I'm like, glad I down. We like, he like, damn, he get to pulling uh, 12 gauges and Glocks about it everywhere. Glocks about the kitchen, you know what I'm saying? So it's like... I was like, damn, what the fuck going on? You know what I'm saying? And then uh, he finally opened the door, right? Everybody in the whole room got a gun. I'm like, damn, this nigga paranoid, man. Why is he so paranoid like that? But he said he got robbed before, and he'd be damned if they rob him again. Me and Brewster rode over there, and he went to his house. He had an apartment in Oakland. He had an AK, a brand new AK. He had a brand new Glock 9 and a brand new video camera. So we playing, uh, playing some song, rapping on the video camera, playing with the guns and shit and having a ball, and that was about the last time we really kicked it. Send a shout-out to your boy Gable, that Ryan D just had his baby. Yeah, Ryan D, congratulations on your baby. What's up, Gable? Congratulations. I know you named it Tupac. Oh, yeah. Let's check out my message. And eventually, you know, his stage appearances grew more and more. Digital started letting him do more stuff, and uh, then he rhymed for the first time in 1991 on the digital... This is an EP release, uh, which led to him getting his own uh, deal with TNT and releasing the album Tupacalypse Now. While I was hustling or whatever, Tupac would be writing raps a little more than me. He wrote all the time, too. He was just like, mate. And I figured, I, you know, I saw, we used to always say, man, you got to write, you got to write. And I remember he'd like come down, I'd be shooting dice, and I remember he'd come down with like songs like Brenda's Got a Baby, and he'd like, oh, dude, check this out, check this out, come here, man. I'm like, what's up? He showed me, like, I see how he wrote it, you know, Brenda's got a baby. He said he'll start busting the rap, saying he had the chorus already worked out. He'd be like, Brenda's got a... You know, he's like, I'm going to have the chicken to do, singing that with you. I'm like, oh, okay, that's tight. All right, I got to go, you know? And next thing I know, he said, man, come to the studio, meet me at Starlight at 12. We go down there, here he is, booty woo, hooking up songs, you know, just like he said, man. I'm like, oh, that's tight. I remember when he first came out, had so much energy, and when I read interviews with him, even like his definition of niggas never ignorant getting goals accomplished was so deep in the way he used to talk about, you know, black nationalism and black economic communalism and black cultural nationalism and struggle in his songs, Brenda's Got a Baby and Dear Mama. He has so much to give us. I mean, the cat was wealthy. And, and we I all surreal niggas! Freaking <laughs> us! There you go, Pop. She interested. There you go, Pop. She said it's cool to talk to me. Don't you know you got a great pair of legs? <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah, man. For, For her. For her. They talk like that here. For her. For her. 
when we talk like this for her. Walking down the streets in New York, I got a 40, not a court. So listen to the thought. Back in the J Town, I bet they didn't know that Tupac would come up and I'm never going down. And I won't sell my soul. I left wearing silver, came back for gold. Drink, <laughs> no, I ain't fake, and I rape many Trump. They try to play me out, cause I know how to pump the bump. So either back up or get dumped. Cause you know Tupac ain't no chump. My homies from the old block, they all down with Tupac, cause they know my rhymes rock. And they never really change, cause I came back the same, still with the same name. Tupac, I drop any pump I pop. If you think you can rock, then get dropped. Here we go, I can flow, and I ain't through yet. I ain't fronting, but the blunt is going out. Don't sweat, a bite. We don't have the right, but I got the fucking bread. Stop, stop, stop. Let me I'm in New York, watch me hawk high. Anybody wants to front, they can get hit like a motherfucking blunt. And you don't stop. I had heard his material previously, but it didn't strike me as gangster oriented. It was kind of like gangster, but it was kind of like a revolutionary gangster. And to interview him, he struck me as just somebody that, you know, you kicked it with on the corner, man. He was like, he was like one of the boys. He was like, he was really like one of the boys, and I came away very impressed. He was very cordial to me. He, you could see the anger in him, but at the same time, he was a very introspective young man, and we had a very intellectual-based interview, which will, lasted like for more than an hour. And I came away very impressed with him, because it wasn't like some rappers, they just want to get into it for the money. He actually had a plan, you know, a plan of action. It was to make money, but at the same time, he really wanted to sincerely perform for the people. To me, it, it's, it's just like this. It's just the industry to me, I use every, I put everything on the street now. And commercialized rapping is like having sex for the record company. That's like letting them pimp you. So it's cool if you're letting them pimp you and you getting the money. You're reaping the rewards of your, the commercial success. You know what I'm saying? If that's what you want to do, cool. But then come out with some hits, too. You know, come out with some hip hop. If that's what you got to do to bring the bacon on, I can't blame you. Drop that shit. But on the flip side, you better have some old Lottie Dottie shit. You know what I'm saying? And instead of that, they letting, like, you know what I'm saying? Groups, I won't say anything, but, like, you know what I'm saying? A, B, N, N, Factory. They just, you know what I'm saying? They just putting out song after song, making, like, like a fucking, like, this is rap. This is a rap, cause just cause his words are rhyming, that's not rapping. It's a trip, cause I remember when he's rec recording the album, his style, the way it changed, the way he's been growing in his style, or you know, developing, which is what you're gonna do, especially when you're young and you get older, you get, you know, you get tighter as you get older. He, uh, back then, he was rapping more all mellow. All his songs was mellow. I mean, he had songs like "Brenda's Got a Baby," "Words of Wisdom," and uh, you know, "When My Homies Call." Uh, part-time mother all his songs were mellow and cool were like kind of like pop trying to you know cr damn near like I'm trying to make everybody happy but he had a couple hardcore songs you know not really hardcore hardcore like gangster shit just cussing at the world but you know just kind of hard on his level you know that was the Tupac that we was used to kick with that was you know before he started this is right when he was filming Juice but he hadn't let the Bishop thing get to his like rap style yet you know and that's what happened with Strictly For My Niggas when he decided to be, you know, hardcore because now here he is, having done this movie, now he's a movie star and a rap star. And the star he played in the movie was the per the people, the person that uh, people in the, uh, your audience or whatever thought was kind of, damn, Bishop was cold, Bishop was crazy, you know, so now, uh, Tupac, you was Bishop, Bishop, uh, what's up, Bishop? Now he's like hard now. And so he had to, he had to go with that role now all of a sudden, and uh, even though that wasn't really him. Tupac. I wouldn't say daily, it's more like minutely ritual. Yo, I got to have a blunt every minute, and if I see another bitch, I swear I'll be up in it like the one we saw down there. The Puerto Rican, she wasn't speaking, but I saw that ass, and I swear to God, I was tweaking. <laughs> I just had to have some, just like a piece of gum, maybe bubble yum. I want to chew it, do it, screw it, and leave it alone, because, yo, you know how I bone. Sweet black pussy. And when Pac came through, he liked fucking with us because... We always, like, we always kept good unity, and we had, like, you know, 15, 16 motherfuckers in the house all the time. You know right. what I'm saying? And 
That's where we. That's where me and my boy we came up with this idea for a group called Two from the Crew. So yeah. our thing is TC the Crew. Well, some of them songs we did. Yeah, we did um, lifestyles of the poor lifestyles and homeless. Lifestyles of the poor and homeless. Let's get it on. Yep. Get um, some for girls. All that old shit. Yeah, this is back in '86. Then our our key our our theme song was the Thug Life. Yeah. You know and um, we came out with that song because I came out with that song because um. Living here in Marin County, you know, this is this is the only this is the only place where it's majority blacks. You yeah, know this, what I'm this saying? Ghetto, this, this, the only it, ghetto, this the ghetto here in Marin County. This the ghetto in So every time we step out, people are always stereotype stereotyping us like thugs, yeah. thugs, they thugs, they thugs, right? Yeah, along so, with our grandmother and them calling us little thugs and heathens and yeah, shit like that. Real, so, so we adapted that identity. You know what I'm saying? And, you know. We, we put that song out. He had, what happened, he had came to me one day. We was over there on the other side. He had came at me and he said, cool, man, I got this hook, you know what I'm saying? And he was he was talking this thug life, but he couldn't put it together, right? And um, I played with it for a while, you know what I'm saying? And then um, I, I started singing something. He, say, he, he was saying thug life, and I say, shut up, bitch. Yeah. And then, you know what I'm saying, we started putting it together, and we came up with this little concept, you know, the thug life. And Pac liked that shit hell of a lot. You know, when he came out here, out of all our songs, that was the one he had key on. He'd say, uh, uh, swing that to me again, you know what I'm saying? Why don't you throw that shit at yeah, me that again? Yeah, that was like the song. Every time people would see me and my boy together, because we, you know, it was Dickie Dang and the player Shari. That's right. You know, they'd see us, and they'd want us to sing that song. Yeah. And they liked, they liked us singing that song because they could feel, we, you know yeah. what I'm saying, we was coming real with it, you know a what I'm saying? Especially in the parties, you could see the impact it had, because um, when we up there on mics and shit, we on the, when we on the mic and thing like that, and we singing that shut up bitch slogan, the yeah. whole party. Shut up bitch, you know what I'm saying? And it's song like that, you know? Yeah. It's like adapted to that, cause he, he liked the unity we had with each other. Cause you know what I'm saying? It's like, if, if you fuck with one, you gotta fuck with everybody. That's you right. know what I'm saying? And he loved that unity. He always wanted to be a part of something. Yeah. That's why people say he liked the West Coast more. Yeah. Cause it was a lot of love. And, and I Thug Life originally, it was him and um, Stretch Walker who was from New York, and Stretch was was uh, connected with a lot of people on the East Coast, such as Notorious B.I.G., and the whole Thug Life idea was that, you know, these people would be like United Ghetto Soldiers. They'd be able to walk into any hood, anywhere. When I say thugs, I mean, like, niggas who don't have anything that, you know, they, they, got, they dress like the killers of the thugs, because we all come from the same thing, but they don't have nothing, but they got that talent, they got that spark, they got that certain something, whatever it is that can get them out. Those, those are thugs now. That's the redefinition of it. And it was really Tupac, uh, this guy from Inglewood named Big Psych, um, who was involved in the hardcore underground scene there, uh, Tupac's brother, Mo Preem, and two other guys, Macadocious and Rated R. And they were Thug Life, and they eventually released an album called Thug Life Volume 1, I think in late 93, early 94. Um, and that album did go gold, um, but I guess it, uh, it got held up for up to a year um, because the record company decided that the first product that they came out with was too, um, how do you say, too underground, too hardcore. I never thought I was necessarily the best rapper, the best nothing. I think I'm the, the realest nigga out there. Uh -uh. I do think that. I think I own that. If I could pack being real, I think I own that. Because I think being real is just being true. Is the camera on? Yep. Sir. Check this out, G. I'm Tupac. I'm with this. And I have my money all on my tape, and I want it now. I want my tape. Office, nigga. You can't sell my shit. I want that. Let's beat. Take the money out of my pocket, money. Now I want my shit. I want my tape now. I'm gonna fuck your whole stand up. You understand what I'm saying? You don't understand? That's my tape. That's me. That's my group. Now you're taking money from me. You're selling my tape, but you got to pay me for my record. You understand that? Man, you gotta take my tape down. If you're gonna take my tape down immediately, I'ma take your tape down. You take it all at the same time? I'ma do like that. Look, what is the You know what I'm saying? Because you're not taking it down. Hey, take the tape off. Come on, man, I'm serious. Hey, hey, take the tape off. You have police that take this out, but not the I have the right to do it. But you take the tape off for police. No, I don't have to take it to the police. You, know, you can take, take it police. to the police. I'll drop the list. Don't drop this there. Drop this there. You got my tape. You got your shit. I'll throw your watch.
selling my tape. He's stealing from me. You understand the musician of that tape, man? That's my tape. No, he didn't pay for no, We didn't get paid. You get paid off my sweat. You can't say shit. Mind your business. You mind your business. You ain't got shit to do with it. Pay attention. Fix your watch, Stan. You understand? Now, partner, you, if I see my tape over here again, by the word of God, I swear, I'm dropping your shit to the concrete. That's mine. You're robbing. I'm not playing. I'm going to watch a movie. When I finish, I'm coming back. If my shit is out here, I'm dropping it. And if he says something, I'm dropping his watch. I'm serious. Fuck around. Fuck around. Fuck around. Yo, all my homies back in the, in, in the O and the J, all them niggas, fuck y'all. Y'all ain't here right now, so fuck all y'all. Nah, what's up tomorrow? Hey, all them niggas. I don't know what's up. What's up? Who is it? Who is it? Who is it? Who is it? Yeah, I want some, um, eggs. What I want? Sausage. Some eggs and sausage. <laughs> Starving. Oh my God. Tracy, baby. What's happening, baby? Trying to get my morning. <laughs> See how you do me? See? Cloud. Tell them niggas up now. You tell them. Fuck off. Say it again? Cloud. I got cloud. Watch this. Watch this. Can I shot. get some orange juice too? Egg sausage and orange juice? Yes, thank you. What you can get here, go get as soon as possible. Get three orange juices. Three, because you know me. Thank you, baby. Thank you, baby. See? Three guys. <laughs> Tupac had a charisma. He had a special charisma. There was something special about him. You saw it in his, some of his records. You saw it, more, I th saw it a little bit more in his movies. You know, he had that glow, he had that charisma. There was nobody else that looked like him. I mean, he had the, he had the eyebrows, he had the cheekbones. He was like, you know, handsome. You know, sometimes when you see him sitting there introspective, you know, if you're a woman, you know, you wanted to go over there and we'll ask him, well, well, Pac, what's wrong? What can I do for you, baby? You know, he had, he had that special glow about, it, about him that, uh, that attracted you to him right away. This is why I do the doo-doo at, look, at the film. Oh. Ain't nothing changed, ain't nothing changed. For all my niggas back home, I want you to know I'm not changing. I'm still real. I'm still that same nigga, a blunt. I'm still real, jerk. <laughs> Don't be so hard on your mom, man. She ain't doing all that, you say. I'm gonna show her this, man. <laughs> I love you. say that little skinny motherfucker. I love you, baby. Wait, who's the Mac, though, Tupac? He ain't the Mac. I'm the motherfucking Mac. That's the Mac. Mac. I'm the motherfucking Mac tonight. Well, show me who's the Mac. Huh? He said you ain't got shit on him. He said he, he ain't having Mac it. in the moon. He the, the Mac on the moon. About the moon he get all the bitches on the moon. He said he ain't having it, though. Hey. Y'all go to California? Yeah. You live in California? Yeah. It's gonna be Tupac's new girlfriend. Huh? This is Tupac. Tupac? Cheers. Yeah. Oh, you didn't want him to tell me your name? Why? What's your name? Shasha. Y'all can't see. Yeah, That's my, my nickname. That boy live right around the corner here. Right on um, oh. 50... Uh, so what y'all doing out here? Going to movies. Y'all just out here visiting New York? Doing a movie. Doing a movie? Yeah. Doing a movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So y'all doing a movie out here? What kind of movie? Action adventure. It's an action adventure. Action adventure. Y'all lying. Lying. I look like I'm, I'm down for some action adventure. All my niggas look like we down for look, some look. action adventure. So you see what y'all doing out here? That's how it is. Movie. And movie. Movie. I think it's my job. Doing Wait. a movie. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not from here, I'm from D.C., but I got, I got to finish school, I'm going to finish school next year. Okay, I'll see y'all in the movie, I guess.
can't get us a discount? Mm -hmm. Can't get us a discount? I wish I could. No, I don't even get one. You know how New York is? They ain't gonna keep me warm. How long you been going with her, man? Yeah, tell me. I'm not fucking with that big bitch. I was trying to get us in. You wanted the coochie. Tell I wanted to get us in. The theater. Sure. She I'm can't play with the yo-yo. She can't play with my yo-yo. Right, yeah. So. Yeah, she can play with my gazoo. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you look at Bishop and Juice, he was a thug. You know what I'm saying? And that's how Tupac wanted to sort of put it thing out like Bishop, he's a thug. Don't don't fuck with him. Don't fuck with me. You know what I'm saying? I ain't i I'm I'm willing to die for what I believe in, this and that. That's the attitude he wanted to portray, but he wasn't really like that. You know what I'm saying? I mean, he probably never got the chance to love nobody because ain't nobody ever loved him. After this bishop shit, all of a sudden people thought he was hard and that's all it took. It convinced him, okay, I just got to be hard. And uh, he started making that change. And before you know it, now you got Tupac thug life. Strictly, you know, he comes strictly for our niggas. He throwing a couple tattoos and shit, you know, and all of a sudden, you know, he's starting to change that slow progression to the Tupac he was or the Machiavelli he was before he, 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 he died. Put, put the camera back there so I can say, fuck y'all bitches. Do look like I need y'all. Y'all don't suck my motherfucking ass. Fuck them bitches. Them young, disease-carrying hoes. Yeah. All them young white broads. How you know they got diseases, man? Because they been passing their shits around like they was papers. You cut some never, them. never. Because I don't fuck <laughs> with them bitches. I don't <laughs> fuck with them whores. <laughs> Damu, you know which ones is passing them shits around because you seem to always catch one. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you know you my nigga, Moose. <laughs> but you do be catching them, though, G. <laughs> you and Pogo, y'all some famous, let me get some, and burn it. Burn. <laughs> burn and sold his dick, man. <laughs> man, your dick ain't even working. <laughs> that shit don't went to the clinic so much. <laughs> no, we live in my house now. Fuck everybody. Oh the the mo open movie Juice, he had a um, pajama party in Frisco. In his first movie, oh man, he was so excited, you know what I'm saying? He called my house, Troy, man. I know you coming, you know, you Kendrick and your boys, you know what I'm saying? So we rented a limo, and uh, we, he had a limo, we was behind his limo, we were in Frisco, and we parlay, and we have a good time. And after the thing was over, they had an after party in Oakland. So he said, yeah, man, y'all follow, y'all limo follow our limo. And he was kicking half the people out, you know what I'm saying? This is my favorite interest in my boy. He, he, he said, okay, these niggas here, I want you to make sure they in, you know what I'm saying? Give them a little pass and everything, you know what I'm saying? He treated like king, and that's why I have to say that was my favorite incident that he didn't leave us out. Even though he did, you know, kind of shied away from the jungle after that little incident down here happened. Never forgot about never, he never forgot about his real boys, you know what I'm saying? I, I'll, I'll give him that. And uh, we were following him, and a car, they shot up our limo. Somebody drove by in a car, and my brother was up in, you remember that? Yeah, I remember. <laughs> my brother was up in the, sticking out his head off the limo, and they said something, and we don't know if they was after Pac or after us, you know, it was just like three limos and we were following their limo. They just came and just blasted our limo mm -hmm. and bullet holes all through the, through the car doors and shit. One bullet went through my partner. Yeah, went through my partner's legs yeah. and hit the radio and I'm right here on the door and it, if, if it would have went through it, it shot me straight in the ass. Okay. Him very hot. <laughs> okay. <laughs> if Bishop from Juice was was a reflection of young black males today. I, I wouldn't be honest if I didn't show another reflection. All of our young black males are not violent. They're all not taking the law into their own hands. They're all not going to that extreme to accomplish some sort of um, achievement in their life. So this is just another way of showing how you can be a young black male and accomplish something. Lucky is doing it the opposite way the bishop did. He's working, he's very responsible, he's deliberate about the things he's doing, he's taking care of his daughter. He's a respectful person, you know what I'm saying? He lives at home with his mother. He's not sweating it. That's where he wants to be. He wants to work. He wants to set goals and accomplish them. This is the barbecue with the hot sauce. Oh, you Props ain't know about the hot sauce. So you got to think hot sauce. Got to have the hot sauce. It's real. It's, it's just how you feel when you get around somebody you like and you can't express yourself. Everybody's going to feel that frustration. Everybody's going to feel that stutter when you want to say something and you don't come out right. Everybody can relate to that black, white, small, tall, fat, sore, skinny, all that. Yeah. So that's what it's about. It's like, it's just that, that awkwardness of being around somebody that you really enjoy and you really want to get to know better. But you don't want to give up nothing. They don't want to give up nothing. So we, it's a tug of war game. He used to come back. And I remember the first time he got into, uh, got into an argument, 
we came down, he came down, he first he first learned how to drive. He had a little green Celica. He used to always drive in the jungle and shit. He had his little backpack on, had a little sailor phone. He used to shoot dice. You know what I'm saying? In the morning shooting dice to the late night. All that shit was in the jungle. So he's shooting dice and shit. He he'll win and lose a little bit of money. And then he'd come back kicking smoke weed and he'd play he'd play some of the songs he'd been making, you know what I'm saying, to get vibes or whatever. I guess he was coming to town to get away. But one day he came out there and we was in his car, we was just, you know, grooving off the off the off the blunts. And uh and Ricky Coleman he came. He was like, you know, Tupac, what's up? Why are you claiming Oakland? You know what I'm saying? Why, you know, why are you saying Marin City ain't nothing but you know what I'm saying, motherfuckers selling dope and bitches getting pregnant, you know, because that was what was going around the town. So Rick addressed, you know, he ain't dressed him in a respectful way. He was like, fuck you, you know what I mean, get the fuck up out of here, you know. So Tupac was like, man, I got to go, man, before I shoot somebody out in this motherfucker. And I'm like, man, that's cool, man. And Rick was like, man, you a punk motherfucker, you know, kept calling him out his name and shit. And the Pac was like, I got to go. He, he always received love from us because we all had love for him, you know what I'm saying. It wasn't like when he made it, it was like that it was bad vibes or, for all of us, but it, it was like, you know what I'm saying, he, it was one brother that made it, we just expected a little bit like from him to help us help us out, the other his other fellow rappers. The complaint was over negative comments Tupac made concerning the residents of Marin. The conflict came to a head at the annual Marin City Festival, which Tupac attended as a guest. The end result was a six-year-old child being fatally shot. A few weeks before the incident took place, me and Tupac was backstage in the Richmond Auditorium here. He was performing there that night, and um, it was me, my brother Charles Jr., and my cousin um, Brian Tyne. So, uh, as we got to talking and shit, we, we brought up the festival because it was time for the festival to come around. And then we had told Pac the festival was going to take place, you know. Maybe he ought to come over and, um, you know, holler at us or something like that. Yeah. So uh, we left there and headed on back to Marin City. Then um, a few weeks, when the festival came about, he, he came. He was actually there. The girl, Layla, she had came up to me and she said, uh, are you still cool with Tupac? I'm like, yeah, that's my dog. We still cool. Ain't no problem. Because it was some type of controversy. He had supposed to say something about the... Um, the people here in Marin City. So um, so she said it was cool. You know, I told her it was cool. And um, at that time, 5150 was on the stage, you know, and they had they had just got off the stage. And uh, my brother Charles Jr. came and said, you know Pac here, don't you? You know what I'm saying? Let's go holler at Pac. I was like, okay, in a minute. I was with my kids, and we enjoying the show and shit. So uh, I walk over there, and um, Pac, Pac with Man Man and, and a few bodyguards and shit like that, Maurice Harding. And I walk up to him, and I'm like, man, what's happening? How you doing, Pac? He's like, what's up? Where you been, boy? I've been looking for you all over the place. So we get to talking and shit. We cutting it up, you know, trying to establish the next time we're going to meet or something like that, right? And um, this guy walked over, and he's like, man, what's up? And he was walking up on Pac like he was ready to hit him, right? And man, man um, stepped up in front of him like, man, you know what I'm saying? What's up? You got a problem or something? You know, like, you know, bodyguarding Pac and shit like that. Like, nah, ain't no problem. He do say it ain't no problem. So he walk off, right? And Demetrius come over, you know? And he's like, man, you know you're not supposed to be around here, you know? And he fire on Pac, boom, he hit him. And then all kind of commotion start jumping off. You know, like when it's a fight, everybody come to, you know, see what's going on. And when that commotion jumped off, it was a, a backpack that was handed around, you know, these little kids that came with Pac, it was about six little kids, you know? And um, they had a little backpack, and they, that's where the gun came out of. So they, they got the gun off the pack and shit like that. Um, some people say Pac got the gun, but I never seen the gun in Pac's hand. I seen it in, in Maurice's hand. So um, Maurice was over here at this time. When the commotion broke off, somehow he had ended up over here. And it's like people running around frantic and shit like that, you know? No, at first, they, they looking at the, inc the fighting incident. So when Maurice got the gun, that's when people went into a panic. And um, he cocked the gun. And he tried to shoot, the gun jammed. And I, he cocked it a good, again. I'm looking at him the whole time. He cocked it again, tried to shoot. N nothing happened. Then, like, on his, third on his third time cocking it, he shot, and boom, that was it. Everybody started screaming and yelling and, and running. And I, I turned around, and I ran and dove. After the, uh, after the shots was fired and shit, you know, when I didn't hear no more shots, I, I raised my head up, you know what I'm saying, to see what was going on. And then uh, um, the... It was people already in, in pursuit of him, you know. They was already chasing him and Harding, and the little kids had went a different way. You understand what I'm saying? And it was Harding and Tupac that went the same, ran the same way. So what they did, they ran here, and they jumped over this fence. You know, even at that time, Pac being my friend, I, I had to make a decision, you know what I'm saying? I mean, I got, he didn't, somebody shot, you know what I'm saying? He, he's shooting around, and all my family down here, my kids and shit. I'm like, you know, I felt like, you know, fucking him up or something. So I, I grabbed a big-ass rock, and I ran behind, uh, Michael Gibson and um, Harding, right? 
I'm gonna just hit the car, break the window or something, so we can uh, so, so he wreck or something, so we can get in that ass or something, right? But um, when I went over there and I got over the fence, Michael Gibson was already there, and he in the car, he just putting them on pop, uh, 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 he just throwing, you know, what I'm saying, he just putting them on him, right? While the police and everybody is around, I'm like, well, God damn, I don't got to do shit. There it is, you know what I'm saying? So I step back and um, uh, somehow Pac get him out of the car, and I think. Uh, I think Maurice is driving at this time. It's like people trying to just turn the whole fucking car over and shit like that. He, he was in a Cherokee, actually a Cherokee Jeep. So he, he they're they going to just run people over, you know what I'm saying, getting the fuck up out of there. He continued up this street right here, you know. Um, uh, you got about 200 mad motherfuckers, you know, running behind him. He wasn't driving fast or nothing like that. I think he wanted to turn into the police station right there. But for some reason, um, he stopped like about right here for some reason and just stopped. But I think he got out because the police presence was known. But at the same time, you got 250 motherfuckers mad. They hit, they, they already tearing, destroying the truck. They hitting, him with, hitting the truck with bottles and bricks. I mean, you should see that car after they finished with it. They beat the, they fucked the car up so bad. But um, let's see, when I, when I came around, the police were standing with their shotguns. They was trying to, you know, people to calm down and shit like that. They was hitting Pac so hard it, with rocks and bottles that he climbed up under the, the front end of the police car. He was literally up under the, under the, on the ground up under the car. You understand what I'm saying? And the, the police couldn't do nothing to, to stop it from happening. So uh, they finally was able to um, calm people down and disperse people, you know, as more police units came and shit like that. They was finally able to um, get the crowd calmed down. So they, they took him. And instead of taking them to the substation right here, they took them around to Sausalito, to the um, substation of Sausalito, which was a probably smart decision because you would have had a thousand people out there, you know, not, not going to wait until Tupac came out, you know, wouldn't have been able to get him out of there. And that's pretty much was it. Although not directly involved, the Marin City shooting was first in a long line of troubles that Tupac faced. As his fame grew, so did his legal troubles all across the country. Charges ranging from assault to the shooting of two off-duty police officers splashed across headlines, making Tupac Shakur the most famous rapper in America. But his most serious charge was one of rape, an accusation that Tupac always denied. It was on the night of November the 30th, 1994, when Tupac and his entourage went for a recording session at the Quad Studio in New York, when two gunmen opened fire and shot him a total of five times. Once, once he was shot and then survived, and you know, was pulled, pulled into the ambulance, you know, giving the finger, you know, and then came back to his, his case the next day to, you know, to find out, you know, whether they, they um, prosecuted him or not, whether he was guilty or not. I mean, that was it, you know, legend was made. There was, you know, there was no turning back for, for the hip hop, you know, community as far as Tupac was concerned. He was like, you know, a heroic figure. When he got shot, I feel he got shot for a reason, you know? I mean, like, say he got shot in the balls, that's for raping a girl. He got shot in the head, that was for always holding guns and shit. Then he got shot damn near to the head, and that was for Kai. You know what I'm saying? I mean, so, and he still lived, you know what I'm saying? I, I feel that was his chance for him to turn around, because that's when he did me against the world. But I, I feel that all that anger and shit ate him up so much that he couldn't hide it, you know what I'm saying? I think he tried, but he couldn't hide it. You know, that's why he always talk about, well, I'm a die and bury me a G and all that other crazy shit. See, Tupac wasn't crazy, but from when he grew up from a little boy until he was 25 when he died, you know, he didn't really get to be a man. But that's why he was so mentally fucked, you know, his mom was on drugs, his sister, you know, it was hard because he was older, he couldn't do that for her at the time. And, I mean, I feel the same way because I live that way. And it's like, I mean, by the time you get the money or where you need to go, it doesn't even matter. It's like the money supports the habit now, you know what I'm saying? So, I mean, he wasn't crazy. He had a lot of sense, but there was a lot of things he couldn't control. It was after he went, went to jail for his uh, uh, sexual assault conviction, and um, nobody would bail him out. His bail was set at 
a million dollars. You know, he was here was this guy that was just a bad boy. Um, his media image portrayed him as as a someone completely out of control, who was very much like his uh, screen persona. Um, you know, nobody would bail him out. Nobody would put up the one million dollars. Um, and the only person that did that was uh, Suge Knight of Death Row Records. Right, when I was right. in jail, bad boy, Puffy was the crown fucking Don. Even though Suge, as big as he was, and Snoop, right, right. at that point, they, they just with two million sales, it, they, they took the whole shit. Yeah. Because Suge had Snoop to worry about with the trial. He couldn't right, be right. out there. That's what you're supposed to do. Right, 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 right. Into Tupac, a young captain. I want to uh -huh. join the family, Don. Get me out. I want to join the family. Got me out. Boom. I'm out. I'm in the family. We make out. We did. We went through some sacred shit, me and this nigga. Uh -huh. Me and this nigga shit. We was, every day I did my album, he was there every day. Uh -huh. Every night we stayed up. We tossed it up together. We went out. We went to Mexico together. Went to Hawaii together. We went everywhere. Took this chain right here. He probably made this the most popular item in the world. I mean, he took it and he flashed it on all eyes on me, he flashed it all the time. It was the it was the proudest thing he can be involved in. He was uh Pac was Pac come from a real deep background for us the Panther Party. And Pac used to say, Me and you and Death Row, we like the Panthers party, but we're not going around there saying black power, this black power, that we actually doing stuff. You know, we feeding people, we we give him jobs, we give him, we give him hope. Tupac wanted to be a leader. You know, he had the charisma to be a leader. You know, he had the intelligence to be a leader. You know, he had everything, you know, he had the credentials to be the leader, but he didn't have, you know, have what, what the psychological know-how, you know, to, to, re to really be, become a leader. Instead, he was more of a follower. And I think that's what brought him into the death row camp with, with, with Suge Knight. He was impressed with Suge. You know, it was almost, it was almost like hero worship. The greatest joy to me that Pac would tell you, he wouldn't sugarcoat it, he would tell you the truth. Like the first time, which it was things I didn't even know. The first time, ever, first time he ever been to a basketball game in his whole entire life, I took him. And it was the Lakers playing the Bulls. And you know, we had our floor seats around the floor, you know, with the food, and cracking jokes, talking about the players, Robin running here, talking about this person. And we would make a big, big thing about it. So after the game, he'll grab me and be hugging me. He said, man, I had so much fun. He said, don't you know, this is the first time I ever been to a basketball game. <clears throat> so you look back and go, man, you act, that's like you actually done something good. Uh, about four of my partners, we flew down to Vegas. My buddy lived down there. And uh, we was going to the clubs and hanging out. 662. 662. Six, six, yeah, that's it. 662, six, yeah. yeah. So uh, we, we pull up to the club on a Friday night. We get there Thursday. We come up on a Friday night. And we ask them, what time the club closed? And they say, oh, it closed around whenever Pac and them leave. We say, Pac in there? They say, yeah. So we need to hook up with our boy. And we look and he and his drop top uh, Rolls Royce. You know, I'm proud of my boy. I say, Pac, we jump out the car, you know what I'm saying? All these brothers rush up with guns, you know what I'm saying? Come out with their guns out and shit. We was like, yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Straight up, hey, man, I ain't got nothing to do with nothing. He said, they're my partners, they're my partners. Yeah. So he rushed up, he gave us nothing but love. You know, he hugged us, he said, hey, man, I ain't gonna lie. I like to kick with you niggas uh, as much as I can, but uh, I'm about to go fuck baby. We was like laughing and uh -huh. shit, you know what I'm saying? He said, but I'll tell y'all what, y'all meet me here tomorrow and uh, I'll get y'all in. And we was like, all right, cool, cool. So uh, next night, we, you know, we parlaying. And after the fight, went to the fight, kicking it. We go to the club, he pulls up in the roads, him and Suge. And, you know, there's so many people just going Tupac, going crazy. I just, I, I knew he had love for us when I just broke out and said, Jungo. That's all he looked. He looked. He spotted my face and said, yeah. So I, you know, feel like a little celebrity, pull on up, you know what I'm saying? He say, uh, yeah, man, y'all niggas meet me in the back and I get y'all in. So we out there for about an hour, you know what I'm saying? My partner's is ready to go. I say, man, fuck it. He ain't getting us in. It's part late night, you know what I'm saying? Let's get on. So right when we get ready to leave, he looks, he sticks his head out the door and say, there he is right there. Uh, pfft, treat us like kings. Got us in. We in the back, chilling like superstars, you know what I'm saying? Danny Boy, uh, Tyson, 
Pac, Suge, we back there just kicking like major giants, you know what I'm saying? He give whatever y'all want to drink, man, you know, we drinking, drinking, and uh, smoking blunts, weed, everything. We go in the club, we parlay. I don't see my boy for the rest of the night because I'm, I'm a freak. Hell, these niggas know I'm a freak, you know, I get freaky, you know what I'm saying? I'm on the dance floor all night, you know what I'm saying? And uh, after we, you know, it's about 5 o'clock in the morning, we about to bounce up out the club. I come up to him, I give him a hug, man. I say, man, you stay up, man. I'm proud of you, boy, you know what I'm saying? You keep, keep alive, you know what I'm saying? And the look in his face, you know, I can tell that he wasn't, you know, he wasn't really happy, you know what I'm saying? So we, me and my boys bounce him, we get outside, I say, man, that man ain't happy, man. He said, how you can tell? He said, man, you see his face? It's like Suge was running everything. I'm not to let that be known. Suge was running everything, like snapping his fingers, and niggas was just running and shit, you know what I'm saying? But uh, I told him, you know, he didn't look happy. People felt that Tupac or myself attacked people. Pac only attacked the people who wasn't right with the community. That's how he really felt. If it was a rapper who was fake and they were only doing it for the money, Pac attacked him. If it was a rapper that messed with guys and go both ways, Pac didn't feel that was good. He was because Pac felt he was real serious about the music. Mm -hmm. So if you're a producer or you rap and regardless if you're married or not, and you and you got a boyfriend that works for you, a real boyfriend who used to be a dancer, Pac would have studied all the facts. Pac was real smart. So before he say something, he'd go and do his homework. He said, okay, this guy right here, they say he gay, he go both ways. I'm not going to put it out there on him yet, but I'm going to do my research. And if it's true, the world should know, because this guy might be around one of, one of those little kids one day and mess around with him, and, you know, so I'm going to do it to actually save him from molesting a little child. That's why Pac attacked certain rappers and said they gay. Sug is the boss. You the boss of Death Row. Sug is the Don. You understand? But I'm the underboss. I'm the capo. That is my job. For the protection of all of Death Row, to do what's, what's best for the all of Death Row. And Snoop, to do what's best for all of Death Row. My decisions wasn't based on I'm coming to Death Row taking shit over. My decision was based on Dre not being there for Snoop doing his trial. Right. And this was all for real shit. Uh -huh. You understand? And, and that his, he wasn't producing shit. Other niggas was producing the beats, like on my album. Other niggas was doing the beats, and Dre was getting the credit. Uh -huh. And I got to go on MTV and be like, yeah, he did this, he did that. No, he ain't do it. He uh -huh. is a dope producer, but he ain't worked in years. And I got tired of that. I, I didn't think we needed that. I, didn't, I think we didn't need that. And he was owning the company, too, and he, and he chilling. He owning the company. He chilling in his house, sucking dick, eating pussy. I'm out here in the streets, you know what I mean? Whooping niggas' ass, starting wars and shit putting it down, dropping albums, doing my shit. And this nigga taking three years to do one song. I couldn't have that. But it was not my decision. It was Suge's decision. Suge the one that, that was coming to me, because I was soft on it. Like, you know, well, fuck it, we just keep it in the dark. But the biggest battle Tupac waged was against his former friend and rapper, Notorious B.I.G., or known as Biggie, which added fuel to the East versus West Coast rivalry. I possess his soul, his and puppy. They know that I was the truest nigga involved with Biggie's success. I was the biggest help, I was the truest nigga. I don't write his rhymes, but he know how much he borrowed from me. He know how I used to stop my shows and let him touch the show. Let him blow up and do his whole show in the middle of my show. How I used to buy him shit and give him shit and never ask for it back. How I used to share, how I used to share my experiences in the game and my lessons and my rules and my knowledge on the game with him. You know what I mean? He owed me more. He owed me more than to turn his hair and act like he didn't know niggas was about to blow my fucking head off. He knew. And then, if that's cool, if he disappears, be, be a fucking mouse. Be a mouse. If you are a mouse, be a mouse. But for me to know, like, three weeks ago this happened, and then three weeks later your album's coming out, and you are fucking Don in your album. But you don't know who shot me in your fucking hometown? This nigga's from your neighborhood? And I gotta find out by myself, and, I'm from, and I don't even call myself a Don, just a capo. From the west side, and I'm on the east side in jail, and I know who touched me, and I know everything that happened. Uh -huh. That's power. And he didn't know, so he was faking. And I was mad about that. And then I'm out of jail, and I couldn't believe that everybody was treating Biggie like the biggest fucking star in the world. Right. I couldn't believe that people was buying into the player image. And I just wanted, I wanted to bring back that reality. You know what I mean? It's just like, I can't never, I can't never, nobody can't never be confused and think I'm fucking Mike Tyson and I'm a heavyweight champion. I'm a little nigga. That's why it's so raw to watch me just battle lions, because I'm a little skinny nigga battling niggas three times my size. 
But Biggie is not a player. He's never been. He's never had bitches until he got some fucking money. That's a trick. That's not a player. It's not a papa. So my point was to prove him wrong. I took everything that he glamorized and I personified it. When he first got released from jail, I, we had, I had hopes for him. You know, we had uh, hopes for him that maybe he would get his life back on track. But I don't know what happened in the last year of his life, you know, to make him come to the conclusions that he drew. If I, I'm not the same guy that would come to the awards, have a problem with somebody, and whoop their ass in front of everybody. So now I got the radio, I see a problem, we quelt it, it's out, no big fires, just small little tiny sparks that could be put out. People were starting to say it's an East Coast, West Coast rivalry because it was people just trying to make money. It was true people trying to make careers, it was people trying to get famous. It was people hustling other people out of money mm -hmm. on the East Coast. You don't have no team, you need us. We from the East Coast, pay us X amount of dollars for protection. And some of these idiots was doing it. For us, how we looked at it is, we looked at it as we representing the West Coast, but we representing the ghetto. Tupac had a conversation with me, and he said, how do you feel I should be in the future? What you like to see from me? And if anything I told him, he would have followed it. Chain of command, that's how we was. I said, I want to see you have a record label. I'll just distribute it for you. You can have your own label, because I don't want you to be 35 years old, Pac rapping. He said, well, cool. The talent got to parlay into something, so that's what I'm doing. I'm, I'm tired of sucking and jiving. This Machiavelli album is my proof of that. I didn't, I'm not predicting what it's going to sell. Um, I'm not predicting none of that, but I guarantee it's going to shake the world. You know, it, it was just as if he didn't really care anymore, and he bought into a lot of the stereotypes that the hip-hop community has embraced. It, it, it was just incredible to just listen to him. It was, it was the same time, it was frightening, it was funny, and it was also very sad. Because that could have been any one of us. Had he been corrupt, had, was, it made you ask questions. Was he corrupted by his fame? You know, was he taking bad advice? Or when he threw in with Death Row, you know, was that like his own personal death wish? Tupac done the album. He called me and said, look, Call my house right now. It's about three in the morning. <clears throat> I go over his house. I smoke my cigar. He's smoking the cigarette. He said, "Look, I want the album cover to be me on the cross. Cause I feel I've been cr being crucified. I'm here to be crucified, like Jesus. He said, I'm not climbing religion or nothing, but that's what I feel." And I told him, you know, as usual, I handle it for you. So I called Whiskey and he and our art department, and they done it. And Machiavelli is like, he feel better about that album than he do All Eyes on Me. He said, because you know, I'm speaking so real. I'm telling, I'm coming all the way from my gut to my heart, out through my mouth, telling the people how I feel. Then I got an album called One Nation. That's for everybody that's shooting darts at me, player hating, you know what I mean, behind this East Coast, West Coast shit. My plan was always to unify, you know what I mean? It was only to, it's like a military coup. When the CIA, they don't just go to the country and start, you know what I mean? They got to get the niggas that run it out of right, here. Right, right, so right, that's right. what we doing. They, they gone now. Now we got One Nation with Greg Knights, Buckshot, Smith & Wesson. Smith and Wesson, Melly Mel, Scorpio, The Looney, Snoop, Corrupt, Daz, Me, Scarface, Cocaine, Bone Thugs, Spice One, all of them on my shit. One Nation. And it's just about the hip hop nation, all the real niggas that I recognize in the game. And it's hip hop nation. And everybody's rapping like we one group. Right, right. And it's gonna be more than one. The first one's coming out on my shit, Machiavelli, and the next, Duck Down, gonna put it out on the East Coast. One Nation Volume 2. How we met, how we came together to work on the One Nation was, was kind of like a spiritual vibe, like a meeting of the minds. Like when, 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 when you hear Tekka still talk about I shine, you shine, and we speak about the shining, and if you've seen the movie The Shining, 
dealing with a type of a mental telepathy or, or 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 inner knowing and just calling out to that to that knowing and it's kind of like he called out specifically to us and us and and just speak it to him over the phone and it was like we knew each other we never hung out before so we knew each other so everything was everything was spiritual and when we met it was all love so like five yo what's up nigga yo i seen you before type of thing you know what i'm saying taking tupac come down the stairs with a blunt early in the morning drew drew high and and, and buckshot is, is playing with the water gun and like it's funny to me to see pop pick up a water gun and play you know what i'm saying he's playing with him buck tech Drew, they running around his big house, his pool, and they're playing with water guns. And it, it was funny because he actually stopped and said, hey, don't wet the windows. <laughs> it cost a lot of money to clean the windows. But it was just like, it was a sunny day, and it was all good. Like, we would go into the studio like we did the, we did One Nation album in like seven days. It was like we was going in like sort for a Bruce fight. Our people would challenge, challenge. They, we was all Bruce Lee's, all Bruce Lee's stepping into the studio. The studio was the challengers, all the different artists who would come up to challenge us. All right, this is how we're going. You want to challenge? We got to kick your ass right now. Then go in, boom, lay it down, write it, boom. Artist to artist, he inspired me. He put the fire in my butt because I seen him really get to work and he really was he 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 got us he gave us a saying we borrowed a saying from him called goat mouth which is what he called his engineers and anybody who was like slacking he would scream goat mouth goat mouth let's come on goat mouth let's go we got to get to work and it was so bug because nobody took it personal or maybe they just was scared of him i don't know On September the 7th, 1996, Tupac Shakur and Suge Knight found themselves ringside at the Mike Tyson-Bruce Seldon Championship fight. By all accounts, Tupac was in a happy mood until one of his entourage pointed out a man who had robbed him a few weeks earlier of his death row medallion. Tupac immediately confronted Orlando Anderson, a known gang member with the Southside Crips, and a brawl ensued. After security came, Tupac and his ever-growing entourage left the MGM Grand Hotel. Orlando Anderson refused to press charges and left with his friends. At 9 o'clock, Shook took Tupac to the Luxor Hotel where he changed his clothes and then went to Shook Vegas home for a party. Approximately two hours later, the party decided to go to 662 Shook's Club. The caravan, led by Shook's black BMW, headed up the Vegas Strip when he was stopped by bicycle police because of his license plates and was let go shortly after. A few minutes later, the caravan made a right at the Flamingo when a white Cadillac pulled up next to them at the crossroads of Flamingo and Caval. A man came out of the car shouting at the BMW and then started to fire a gun. When, it, when I heard the shots being fired, Pac stood up to try to get in the back seat to get out to where the shots. <clears throat> That's how he got shot in his hip, which hit one of the bones, the doctor said, and traveled to hit his lung. When he stood up, I grabbed him and said, get down, and covered him. When I pulled him down, that's when I got shot in my head. About 11.17 p.m. tonight, we had several vehicles traveling eastbound on Flamingo. Officers were uh, at the Maxim Hotel investigating a stolen vehicle when they heard several gunshots being fired down below. They saw a caravan of about five cars that were traveling eastbound, heard the shots again, approximately 12 to 13 shots were fired. The officers saw the black BMW followed by a black BMW station wagon and three other cars make a U-turn on Flamingo near the Maxim Hotel. They made a U-turn seated westbound, uh, coming onto Las Vegas Boulevard where they were driving very erratically. They radioed that they uh, heard the gunfire and saw these vehicles traveling in such an erratic fashion. Other officers who were working the uh, strip area were able to get the vehicles stopped here, as you see. 
the black BMW were, was traveling on the rim, on the right side. Once they got here, they found that the passenger in the black BMW had been shot four times, and the driver appeared to be hit with fragments uh, in the head area. I got a deep slash or bullet graze the back of my neck, which if, if it went another inch, it hit my spine and paralyzed me all the way down. But um, before it's an incident, Pac saved my life also. The reason why I say he saved my life because the average person gets shot in the head, the first thing you think is, damn, I'm about to die. You know, a head shot is different. And it was, there was blood coming everywhere. <clears throat> and my concern was him. I said, you hit me? He said, I'm hitting. So I said, I'm going to get you to a hospital right now. So I'm driving like a madman, get, trying to you know, get help to get help him. And the first thing he said, laughingly, jokingly, loudly, is, I need a hospital? You the one shot in the head. Don't you think you need a hospital? His car was riddled with bullets Saturday night in Las Vegas. Tonight, rapper Tupac Shakur is in critical condition. We started getting a lot of phone calls. You know, people were saying that he got a shot. Um, People were saying that, you know, that they saw it on the news, and a lot of people were calling us to find out what happened, and we didn't know. Rapper Tupac Shakur remains in very critical condition tonight after being shot in an ambush in Las Vegas over the weekend. Shakur's right lung was removed after he was shot four times in the chest. Well, I went to the hospital to kind of find out what was going on. He was still, you know, struggling for life, and, and they had just heard that he had opened his eyes. So, like, people were kind of hopeful that, um, you know, he would, he would make it through it. And plus, everyone thought that Tupac was so strong because of the, the prior shooting. You know, he was kind of seen as like this hip-hop Lazarus. Coming up next on the 10 o'clock news, his lyrics, his life reflected a gangster lifestyle. Tonight, Bay Area rapper Tupac Shakur is dead of gunshot wounds. Controversial rap star Tupac Shakur dies of gunshot wounds from a drive-by shooting. Tupac mother was the first one to say, when you have them more, I don't want nobody to wear black. I'm wearing white. Tupac is going to a better place. He's free now. There's nothing nobody can do nothing to him. And I sat back and I thought, I was like, yeah. Can't nobody arrest him. Can't nobody try to put him down. Can't nobody fire shots at him. Can't nobody hurt him no more. He's, he's in heaven in a better place. He was the good, the bad. He is the good. He is the bad, represented the living, the dead, represented the ones who walked on the street, the ones that walked behind the gates, represented the mothers, the children. So nature, Tupac is nature, he's a, Einstein, man, he's a fucking great guy. At the end, he was like getting ready to, you know, getting ready, to, not getting ready to check out of here, but you could see that, you know, somewhere along the line, you had that, you kind of had that feeling he was going to die according to his preaching. You know, he seemed to have taken up power and weapons and, you know, this posse lifestyle as his deity. I mean, Tupac, uh, Tupac you know, he went from one extreme to the other. There was really no middle ground with him. And by the time he, at the time of his death, he was like, what, 24, 25 years old? But it was, a, it was age without maturity, knowledge without wisdom. I mean, order turning to chaos. You know, and it, it seems, Tupac Shakur should stand as a living testament in the hip-hop nation as the pinnacle of greatness achieved, but at the same time, the frailties of human weakness and tragedy. A lot of people have called him a martyr. I don't know if that's exactly true. Um, you can't really say that he died for a cause. I mean, he, I guess he died defending what he believed in, and he definitely, you know, lived that life. A lot of people say live by the sword, die by the sword, but I think Tupac's legacy um, really lies in the fact that he exemplified the condition of the young black male in the 1990s. I mean, I was really feeling it when he died, and all I could think about really was how much potential had 
like we as a people and as a community, as black people, as the hip hop community, as you know, just young people, a generation, how much we had lost. People die all the time, but it takes a real special person to die and always be remembered. Tupac is on the level of Malcolm X, uh, Martin Luther King. I mean, you see, they live forever. Well, give Ken something. I don't owe nobody nothing. I owe, I owe to put back on this planet more than I took. And if I stop right now, I already did that. To New York, I got a 40, not a court. So listen to the thought. Back in the J Town, I bet they didn't know that Tupac would come up and I'm never going down. And I won't sell my soul. I left wearing silver, came back for it gold. Drake, <laughs> no, I ain't fake, and I'll rape many Trump. They try to play me out, cause I know how to pump the funk. So either back up or get dumped. Cause you know Tupac ain't no chunk. My homies from the old block, they all down with Tupac, cause they know my rhymes rock. And they never really changed, cause I came back the same, still with the same name. Tupac, I drop any pump I pop. If you think you can rock, then get dropped. Here we go, I can flow, and I ain't through yet. I ain't frontin', but the blunt is going out, don't sweat. I'm in New York, watch me hawk high. Anybody wants the front, they could get hit like a motherfucking blunt. And you don't stop.